So culture, that's such an odd thing to talk about when we're talking about the rule, the new rules for the industry. But fundamentally, um, organizations, societies, um, and ecosystems all need a culture to, to, to drive them. Let me, let me give you a very simple answer, example. President Ramaphosa is trying to turn the entire country around. So the problem that you've got is we've actually created a culture of state capture, a culture of theft. And so the problem that you've got in, in South Africa is that people actually have um, a value system that says, I'm going to join the, 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 the civil service in order to become a rent seeker. Um, the belief system is I'm entitled to a bribe. The uh, behavior then is to ask for a bribe and become a grant entrepreneur. The processes that we put in place is that we, we, we bypass all of the rules around procurement. The measures that are in place are, well, there's no measures to stop it. And in fact, the rewards and penalties are there are no penalties and people get rewarded. And in fact, we hold up people in the community as heroes for stealing from the state and driving around with all these fancy cars. And so what does that do? That reinforces the culture. That reinforces the value system of actually we should all steal. Now, how do you fix that? Because you've got the same problem, by the way, in crime. You've got the same problem, and, and, and we call this a vicious circle. Now you need to turn a vicious circle into a virtuous circle. How do you build a circle that goes the other way? Now, let, let me give you an example of a virtuous circle. A virtuous circle is what Uber does. right? What Uber does is Uber says, I'm going to get a couple of drivers. If I get enough drivers in a particular area, um, the waiting time will drop. If the waiting time drops, I'll get more customers. If I get more customers, the drivers make more money. If the drivers make more money, uh, I'll get more drivers. All right. And if, if I get more drivers, the waiting time will drop. And if the waiting time will drop, I'll get more customers. And if I get more customers, I'll get more drivers. If I get more drivers, eventually I get enough drivers where I can say I can now drop the, com uh, drop the commission that I'm charging each driver. And so that's a virtuous circle. Amazon has exactly the same virtuous circle. And so what you want to do is switch a, a vicious circle to a virtuous circle. That's, and so the problem that you've got is we, we tend to think of these things as problems, but they're not problems. We don't have problems to be solved. We have polarities to be managed. I'm going to explain that because what I want to talk about is we've got this amazing ambition and we've got this very scary reality. Uh, we often talk about culture eating strategy for breakfast. We'll talk about briefly why that is and how you apply that in an ecosystem. And then we'll talk about this whole concept that if you want to change, if you want to change culture, you really need to manage something called polarities. That's how you do this. Um, and then how do you how do you do it using doing three or four things? And what does this mean to the way that each of us leads going forward? Um, so how do leaders lead when the stability of the past cannot be assured and the future is unknown? So that's exactly what's happening at, as part of that transitions to PIB. Right? Leaders, we all have to learn how to, how to lead in a, in a new world. So the challenge we have is that we've got a transition in PASA from a constraint to a more open PIB system. We're trying to do this during a, a COVID pandemic at the same time that we've got massive macroeconomic challenges. I mean, you might just have an invasion of U Ukraine this week. We don't even know. Um, and, you know, and, and um, you've got macroeconomic challenges, supply chains are under pressure. The South African economy is in, in, in a big hole. Tax revenues have collapsed. Um, and so we try to implement this change. It's a very difficult thing to do. Uh, Ernst Gellner said, modern history is rather like a football cup. 
in which the first round is played as soccer, the second round is played as rugby, and the third round is played as ice hockey. And that's basically the problem. We've got the rules keep changing. And the rules keep changing, and the skills that you need to win at soccer are different to, the, to winning at rugby, which is different to winning at ice hockey. So the question is, what, what do we do? Well, we have to change the way we think. In the world of VUCA, we have to change the way that we think. And so we have to apply something called critical thinking. Critical thinking is um, about how we think rather than what we think. And I'm going to share with, with you what I mean with that, because you've got this huge shift, right, from soccer to rugby to ice hockey. That's what's happening here. And I'm going to share with you what happens as you change. Um, I'm, I'm going to use um, a digital ecosystem as an example, because this is happening all over the world, right? So we've got to change. Uh, we've got to think about how we think rather than what we think. Um, and at the same time, we've got to think about the, the new cultural changes, because it's not just about the 80 or 100 of us on this call. It's about the tens of thousands of people that live in the payment ecosystem and beyond. We all have to change the way that we think about this entire industry. So this is a complex problem. And for every complex problem, there's a simple solution. And it's wrong. Right? You cannot solve complex problems with simple solutions. Why not? Well, let, let's look at what's happening right now in the world right, and in the payment industry. The environment is changing. The requirements that customers and business and government has is changing and consumers has is changing and the technology that we're going to use to fix it is changing. And everything is evolving faster than it's ever done before. So if you go back, you know, 20 years ago, which is when I entered the, the payment industry, it was very simple. We had a card industry, we had a cash industry, we had, you know, interbank uh, payments, and we didn't even have EFTs. I mean, I think we invented EFTs 20, 22 years ago, was South Africa's first EFT on internet banking. Um, very simple world, a world that I refer to as obvious. Sometimes we call it simple. The technology that was we were using was very simple, mainframes, client, client uh, server ap applications. Uh, the technology and the requirements were very clear, and what customers wanted was simple, right? Um, and so we went from bank books to debit cards and to ATMs. It was simple. Then we started rolling out internet banking and apps. And now the world starts becoming complicated. Right? Because now we've got technology is starting to change and the requirements that customers have are starting to change. When we, lost internet, when we launched Internet Bank in South Africa in 1999, it was the second or third Internet Bank in the world. We had no idea what customers wanted. We didn't know whether people wanted to buy shares. In fact, we actually launched share trading on Internet Bank because we thought that's what people wanted. And we were wrong. And then, of course, now suddenly we get to a world of, of mobile apps and we've got Apple Pay and we've got all of a sudden, you know, I mean, standard banks offering me Apple Pay, you know, and you think, wow, you know, um, suddenly f and is telling me, oh, you, you better make sure that you've got enough money in your account because you've got a debit order that goes off next week. And if you don't move money in, um, you are going to hit an overdraft and I'm going to have to charge you. Wow. That's like Vodacom telling me I'm about to go out of bundle. Right. That's amazing. That's a complex world where, where banks and telcos are actually reducing their revenue. Right. Because it's the right thing to do for the customers. And now technology and requirements are becoming quite un uncertain. We're entering a complex world and soon we may enter a chaotic world where we see, you know, you know cryptocurrency, central bank, digital currencies and, and Bitcoin going. Chaotic world. Any currency that loses half its value in a week. Right. <laughs> That's chaos. Right. Because there's no cause and effect here. And when cause and effect aren't linked, you've got a real problem. In a world that's obvious, cause and effect are very clear. In a world that's complex and chaotic, cause and effect are not clear. What does this mean? What it means is technology is evolving. The way that we do things is changing. And what customers want and what businesses want and what the regulator want and what governments want is changing. So we're moving up this arrow from a world that was very simple. I mean, if you look at, you look at the payment industry you know, 15 years ago, I mean, it was very simple compared to what we are about to see happen in the industry. So we're moving from a simple world to a complex world to a complicated world and hopefully not to a chaotic world. What does that mean? It means that in a world of 20 years ago, we had best practice. There was only one way to process a debit card transaction. There was only one way to get a note on a postillion. There was only one way to issue a, a credit card. There was only one way to, 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 to generate a PAN. There was only one way to create offsets for PINs. And, and then we came up with good practice. Okay, this is kind of how you should build an internet bank. This is kind of how you should build an uh, uh, app. Um, and now the problem is we're moving from this red block on the right-hand side to the red block on the left-hand side. We're getting to a world that's complex. In a world that's complex, there is no good practice and there is no best practice. What's the best practice? What's the best practice for acquiring a crypto? I have no idea, 
right? What's the best practice for building a multi-app um, uh, acquiring platform? What's the I mean, Apple's about to convert all Apple phones in the world, listen to this, they announced this yesterday, into acquiring devices. What's the, the, the emergent practice? What's a good practice for, for, for managing a situation where every person with a smartphone is now an, a, a person who can acquire card transactions, or even, even any transaction, it doesn't even have to be a card transaction. Well, now you look, you're entering a world of emergent practice and novel practice. Nobody even thought about this, right? What does this mean? What does it mean? It's a chaotic world. If every iPhone in the world becomes an acquiring device, what does this mean? So we've got to change the way that we think and the way, change the way that we solve problems, which is a fundamental change for us, right? And this is why we say culture eats strategy for breakfast, because your strategy is meaningless here. Right? Any strategy you generate today will not survive first contact with the customer. Your strategy is dead. Right? The minute Apple does this, we're all going to go have to sit back and go, oh my word, well, the entire acquiring industry has just changed overnight. We always talk about culture in societies and organizations. We never talk about culture in industries, and we never talk about culture in ecosystems, and that's about to change. Why is that about to change? Well, because the problem is, if you look at culture generally, you know, there's stuff that you can see above the line. There's the vision and the mission, politics and strategy and external presentations. The problem is most of that stuff's irrelevant because that's that. The problem is all it's the soft stuff, the stuff that's below the waterline, right? And the soft stuff is the hard stuff. It's all this invisible stuff. It's the unwritten rules. It's this. It's it's relationships that we have with each other. It's the values and the norms, right? I mean, how do you change? How do you change state capture? And how do you change this concept of it's our, uh, it's our turn to eat? How do you change that, right? It's very difficult. It's about attitudes and feelings and what people need and what people believe. And if you believe you're not going to get caught, you're never going to stop stealing. And so the problem is you've got to fix the stuff at the bottom to fix the stuff at the top. And this is the challenge that the president has, right? It's very, very difficult uh, problem. And what, and what uh, Judge Zondo has done is he's basically taking the stuff at the bottom and he's making it visible at the top. And that's how you fix that's how you fix it. People are criticizing the president. It's a very, very difficult job to turn a vicious circle into a virtuous circle. So we've got to look at what's beneath the waterline here in our industry. And there are a number of things below the waterline that we never talk about. Let me give you an example of how, how this impacts on an ecosystem. Now, this is a model that was developed by Tata Consulting, which I particularly like. And what it talks about is how ecosystems evolve and how, how your priorities change as you move from the left to the right. When you think about the left-hand side, that's kind of where the, the entire payment industry was for the last 20 years. We were, we, we were on the left-hand side, right? So, so yesterday we were here. We had a platform-aware industry. It was Every industry was vertically orientated. We had traditional value and supply chains, and everything was focused around profit. And we all recognized that what you won, I lost, scarcity-based, and there was a partnership. Then we gradually drifted into this situation of a loose alliance around QR codes. The industry started to blur a little bit. ShopRite checkers is suddenly turning into a bank. It's, it's not clear whether, you know, is, is Apple a, a payment issuer? Is it an acquirer? What is them? You see, the industry is starting to blur a bit. Now you're starting to get into operability challenges. We're starting to get platform orientated. And so we're focusing on tasks, connections, and collaboration. But there's a very narrow focus and usage of the ecosystem model and everything's initiative based. We need a QR code initiative. We need a CBDC uh, initiative. They're all initiative based and opportunistic. And that's where we've been, I think, up to now. We've been in partner cooperation and task collaboration. That's where we've been. Today, we're kind of moving into the green bar. We say, well, you know what? Maybe we need to collaborate for business models. Now we're creating a spirit of co-opetition. I've heard Moritz and Gita use that word often. The industry is slowly starting to erode. The market's starting to erode. There's some reductions in marginal costs. Um, we look at, we're now becoming platform enabled. We're becoming firm centric. And we've got a broader use of an ecosystem model. And we, we are now co-evolving the network together. And all of a sudden, we've got issuers and acquirers and, you know, uh, internet-based businesses and physical-based businesses all sitting at the same table saying, well, we've got to build this thing together. Where do we want to be tomorrow? What is the, the PIB going to have to look like? Well, tomorrow, we're going to have to be up at four and five, right? We, we're going to have to be look, looking at certain, indus certain industry components being sunsetted, right? I mean, 1% of all transactions in South Africa Last year was, um, Standard Bank announced that yesterday, 1% of all transactions was cash, 1%, right? I mean, so when do we start getting rid of ATMs? 
which is already happening in Nordic states, by the way. And so, you know, you've got in the entire industries that are being sunsetted. Um, you've got early stage market cons consolidation. We're going to have a lot more open innovation. We're going to have to learn quicker. We've got a new generation of managers coming, a new generation of capabilities. The ability to create a node on a postillion may not be as important anymore in this new world that we're approaching. Uh, marginal costs might drop to zero and you're starting to get to ecosystem thinking ecosystem and, and yeah. behavior. And eventually you'll move to the right hand side around value integration. So, so really, this is quite, quite a significant change for the industry to go through because all of us have to let go of stuff and we've got to learn new things. So when the rules change, everyone goes back to zero. Look at what happened when apartheid ended in South Africa. Suddenly, all the industries that did well in the past, you know, a BHP Bulletin, GenCore, Anglo, you know, all the rules changed. Suddenly you heard about people like Ramaphosa and Patrice Motsepe and Tokyo Sekwala. We'd never heard of these people before. And suddenly they became the new, the new billionaires. When, when the rules change, Everyone goes back to zero. There are new rules in place and there, there are new winners. And so this is a big reset. And we're going through a big reset. When you, when you, it's often said that the biggest point of instability for any country is when you transition from one form of totalitarian regime to a new form of, dem of democracy. That's when countries become unstable. Right? And the same is true for anything. When you change from one set of rules to another set of rules, you get a big reset and things become unstable. You can see it in, the, in, in what's happening right now because of, of COVID. And the risk is, of course, everyone gets scared, you get anxiety, and we start thinking of, with, with a scarcity mindset. You know, I'm, I'm gonna grab, I'm, I'm gonna get a, a, a land grab. We must, we, we must, it's a winner take all. We've got to dive in and win and grab as much as we can, right? And because there's a transition that's, that's, that's happening. So it's a fundamental shift. And as I said, it's a fundamental shift in culture. Now you ca I, I can't cover all of that in, 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 the, in the time that I've got. I want to just talk about two, two of the things. But basically, the way culture works is you start with a value system. Right? There's certain things I'm not prepared to breach. That gives me a set of beliefs. Belief says I will not steal. The attitude is I'm going to now report on anyone who does steal, and the behavior is I look out for people who are stealing. My action is if I see somebody stealing, I report it. The results are all of us are doing this. A theft gets reported. The metrics are crime starts falling. People go to jail. I get rewarded. That reinforces my values. And if everyone does that, you've got a great ecosystem. So this is basically a, a virtuous circle or a vicious circle, depending on what's being, being, being built on what's being reinforced. So let's talk about values and beliefs here, because I will, I'll talk about two or three of them. But fundamentally, we've got a lot of work to do in this, right? Because he, here's a picture. This is a fundamental change that's going to happen, because at the core is trust, the core fuel for any ecosystem and network economy is trust, right? This is a book called, called The Network Always Wins, a book written by, by Peter Henson. He said, the core fuel is trust. Building trust has to be genuine, uh, rooted in an understanding of the rules of play in the networked society. And what we're about to do is to move rapidly into this networked society. And so it means that each of us have to be leaders of this culture because the leader is one who knows the way, goes the way, and shows the way, which is us. We must become the change that we want to see in the industry because the speed of the leader is the speed of the team. Everyone's watching us to see how we act. So if we don't change our behavior, the entire industry is not going to change its behavior. We need to review beliefs, values, attitudes, behaviors. And you know, until the ANC does this, until the cabinet done, does, until ministers do this, everyone, no one's going to change their behavior until the people at the top change their behavior, right? I'm just using what's happening now at the Zondo Commission and, and with the president as a metaphor for what we are going to have to go through. We have to change. We have to lead this change in the same way that the president has to lead this change. So the cultural implication is we need to shift ourselves to critical thinking. We need new values, beliefs, and behaviors, and we need to walk this talk. Now, what does this mean in practice? Let's take one example, right? If you look at you know, most industries, most industries are, are, and are, have a culture that's underpinned by unwritten rules. One rule is that uh, the, industry, the payment industry is a zero-sum game. Right? So if the retailers get more acquiring, then maybe the banks get less acquiring. So in a zero-sum game, the problem is entirely one of distribution. It's not at all one of production. So everyone's trying to grab distribution. And so many ecosystems turn into land grabs. Right? Think about this. And who's, who's, who's number two to Amazon in America? No one. Who's number two to Facebook? Who's number two to Twitter? Who's number two to Pinterest? Who's number two to Instagram? Who's number two to PayPal? There's no number two. There's no number two because it's a land grab, right? So these ecosystems that have been created that I've just given you examples of are, are, are land grabs, right? 
And so the challenge that we have is we built a world where it's my interests, I win, your interests, you lose. So it's win-lose. It's I win, you lose. How do we change it to we win? Right now, you've got to move to change it to we win. You've got to move away from a zero sum game. A zero sum game, you always get winners and losers. In, that's what a zero sum game means. How do you get to a non zero sum game where we win? Right? Win win. Everyone talks about win win, but what does it mean to build win win? Right? You've got to get this area of overlapping interest. Win win. Now, let me give you an example of, of, of how one builds this, uh, because this, this is, you see, the, the zero-sum game problem is a problem. It's a, it's a polarity issue. It's not a problem. I'll, I'll explain more, more just now. So here's a paradox, right? Charles Dickens says it's the best of times, it's the worst of times. Now, that's odd. Right? How can you say it's the best of times, it's the worst of times? Because that's a paradox. How can we both win? That's a paradox, right? It's a, par it's a dilemma. It's impossible. How can two people win at the same time? Let me give you an example. Is it possible to have abundance and scarcity simultaneously? The answer is yes, right? I've got, I think I've, you know, I've got access to 8 million books on my Kindle. I've got access to 6 million songs on Apple uh, Music, and I've got access to 15,000 movies on, uh, on Netflix. I've got, a, I've got access to unlimited data at, I don't know, 20 megabits per second at my home. So in other words, I live in a world of abundance when it comes to digital assets. But I live in a world of scarcity when it comes to time. I live in a world of scarcity when it comes to safety. I live in a, scarc I live in a world of scarcity when it comes to calmness about where this country is going. Right? So it, simultaneously, I'm in a world of abundance and scarcity. Right? And so it's actually, it sounds like it's a dilemma. It's not a dilemma. It's a paradox. It's a, because it's a statement that appears to contradict itself. The best of times, the worst of times. Now, we've, we are living in a paradox. And win-win is a paradox. How can both of us win? So a good example of this comes from gaming theory. In gaming theory, we often talk about a prisoner's dilemma. So let's say two people have been arrested. If two people are arrested, right, and you say to them, look, if you, if you cooperate, I'll, 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 I'll let you go off in, 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 uh, in one year, right? So if, if, you, if both people, if both of the prisoners who are collaborators, if both of them remain silent, right, they both serve one, one year. If one of them... If one of them betrays the other one, right? If A betrays B, I mean, if B betrays A, A serves three years in jail and B goes free. And the other way around, right? If A betrays B, A goes free and B serves three years. But if neither of them betrays the other, they both serve two years. Oh, I'm sorry, if they both betray each other, if they both betray each other, they both serve two years. Now, logically, in a world like this, there is a win-win. The win-win is if they both say nothing. Right? If they both say nothing, they both serve a year and they come out. That's the ideal situation for win-win is neither of them should say anything because that's actually the best deal overall, right? Because, you know, one year plus one year is two years, whereas if one betrays the other, then someone has to serve three years. And if they both betray each other, then they both have to serve four years. So actually win-win is possible in many industries. But it requires that we do not treat uh, a situation as a problem we have to treat a situation as a paradox. So what is a paradox? You know, um, free or premium. It looks like they're mutually exclusive. I, it's either free or it's a premium. How, how can they be something that's not free and not a, free, a premium? Well, if you go to Spotify, you get freemium, right? Freemium is both. So you see, we, we often look at free and premium as either or. It's either free or it's premium. But actually, freemium is both and. So we move from either or thinking to both and thinking. And what Spotify did was Spotify said, look, I'll give you three months free, but you've got to give me your credit card. And at the end of three months, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start charging you. And you give me permission now to start charging you in three months, but you get three months free. Well, that's very clever, right? That's a freemium model. So in other words, I've given you the best of both worlds, but you can cancel after three months and you can come back in and sign up again, which is what everybody does with, with Netflix. And so this is an example of, of moving away from a problem to a polarity. And it requires that we've, we, we've got to create a common understanding of this move, firstly from zero-sum thinking to non-zero-sum thinking. Right? We've got to start thinking about how to grow the ecosystem rather than how to share the ecosystem. Sharing the ecosystem is about distribution. Growing the ecosystem is about production. So we've got to move from distribution thinking to production thinking. How do we grow this entire thing? And we've got to become more comfortable with the paradoxes because this creates all sorts of, of paradoxes uh, in terms of where we're going. Now, there's a, 
there's a there's a distinction worth making between a problem that you can solve and a dilemma, a paradox, or a polarity that you will need to manage. So what is this thing, right, called a, a polarity, and how is it different to a problem? Well, a problem is, what am I going to have for lunch? So a problem, problem is not ongoing. I'm going to look, look at a problem, I'm going to make a decision, there is an end point, and problems can be solved, right? I need fuel, I'm going to go and buy fuel. It's a problem. It's not ongoing. There is an end point, and it's solvable. Polarities are different to problems. And we often confuse things for that are polarities. We confuse them as, as, as problems. South Africa needs a black government. That's not an answer to a, to a complex problem, right? We try to solve a very complex problem uh, with a very simple solution. The problem is that that's never been a solution. It's a polarity. Polarities are ongoing. That is why 27 years after democracy, South Africa still has a problem. Right? Because it's an ongoing thing. There is no end point. It's not solvable the way we're dealing it now. And so polarities have to be managed together. So you cannot, you, 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 problems are solved, polarities are managed. And what we've tried to do, in, in many cases, we try to solve very complex things that are polarities. We try to solve them as problems and they never get solved. Right? So in life, for example, you have to inhale and you have to exhale. You can't only inhale. Right? At some point, you have to exhale. You, you, you have to be busy, but you also have to rest. You can't only be busy, you'll die. You can't only rest because you won't eat. In leadership, you can either choose to be clear, but then you have to be directive, right? I'm going to tell you what to do because I'm clear, but then you can't be flexible and empowered. So how, but actually, you have to be both. So how can you be, be clear and flexible? How can you be directive and empowered? Companies, I mean, I, I've been in organizations for 40 years and organizations are either centralized or decentralized or on their way from being centralized to being decentralized, or on their way from being decentralized to being centralized. And the reason is you're treating centralization and decentralization as a problem. It's not a problem. It's a polarity. And there are many examples of this, right? And let me give you an example. You know, here are organizational polarities. Are we going to centralize or decentralize? Are we going to have a local culture or a global culture? Are we going to think short term or are we going to think long term? Are we going to be employee focused or are we going to be client focused? There's some leadership polarities. Am I going to be confident or am I going to be humble? Am I going to be visionary or am I going to be practical? Now, the answer is, am I going to focus on profit or am I going to focus on purpose? Now, we treat these things as if they're problems and they're not problems. And what happens is we force a crisis, we create an artificial crisis by forcing people to take sides. And so you go to any organization and there'll be a group of people who believe in centralization and there'll be a group of people who believe in de decentralization. Look at America now. America is a highly polarized country between Republicans and Democrats. Actually, they're both right. You actually need both of their thinking. You need socialist and you need capitalist. You need a socialist capitalistic system in America, but America doesn't even have guaranteed uh, health care, doesn't have edu free education, and doesn't even give you a zero leave days, right? And, and so you've got this weird economy that's incredibly strong that doesn't provide basic social services. And so it's a polarity. And because it, it's not a polarity, people have taken sides and you've created a crisis. So the challenge you have is polarities create a situation where there's benefits from doing both things. There are po positive results from being busy and there are positive results from resting. But there are also negative results from being too busy and there are negative results from resting too much. There's positive results from capitalism, but there's negative results from capitalism. There's positive results from socialism and there's negative results from socialism. And so the problem is we, we, we tend to swing backwards and forwards between these two. And the reality is you probably need both, right? You can't just pick one. So, so the challenge is how do you deal with it? It's like work-life balance, right? It, work, there is no such thing as work-life balance. It's dynamic. Are you, are you married or you're not married? Do you have young kids or don't you have, do you have, are you, do you have kids or don't you have kids? Do, are the kids young or are they old? Are they teenagers or are they not? Are they at university or are they aren't? Have they left their home or haven't they? Because the work-life balance answer is different in every case, right? My mom suddenly became very ill. My entire work-life balance uh, profile changed. It's a polarity. It's not a problem that you can come up with a solution for. It's dynamic. It's not static. The pendulum is constantly swinging, and you have to move with the pendulum. It's like working from home, right? Office-bound versus home-bound. We, we, we treat them as polarities. They're not polarities. I mean, we treat them as a problem. You must either work at home or you must work at the office. The reality is, going forward, we're going to do both. So, so F. Scott Fitzgerald said that the test of a first-rate intelligence is its ability to hold these two opposing thoughts in your mind at the same time while still retaining the ability to function. 
And this is going to be all of our challenge going forward. We're going to have to do this. We're going to have to suspend judgment. You're going to have to say, listen, I'm not going to make a choice. I'm not going to be forced into, into taking a side. I'm going to actually sit back and I'm going to watch both sides because I want the benefits of both and I want to minimize the downsides of both. So how do you know if something is a problem or a polarity? If you answer yes to these four questions, then you are dealing with a polarity. Is it necessary over time for you to have both identified upsides? Is it important to have the benefits of decentralization and centralization? Yes, the answer is yes, you actually do. Will focusing on, upside, on, on the one upside to the neglect of the other eventually undermine your efforts to move towards your higher purpose? That's exactly what's happened in South Africa. You've, created, you've tried to create black economic empowerment, but you've destroyed the economy. Now, the problem is our higher purpose was to build a bigger economy. All we've done is be focusing on distribution of who gets what. We didn't build a bigger economy. The economy shrunk, right? So you know you're dealing with the polarity the minute that's true. Is the difficulty ongoing, like breathing? You've got to breathe in and breathe out and breathe. Yes, South Africa's problem is very much one of, of, of being a polarity. It's an ongoing problem. And we've never solved it, by the way. That's why the problem keeps getting worse. Um, and so... Um, and so you know if it's a polarity if the problem just keeps going, it keeps on going, right? So in other words, centralization, decentralization never gets solved. Speed versus quality never gets solved. Localization, globalization never gets solved. It's, it's a problem for 20 years. If it's a problem for 20 years, it's not a problem. It's a polarity. Are there two alternatives that are interdependent, meaning you can only focus on one pole for so long before you, you're required to focus on the other pole? It's like inhaling and exhaling. Right. It's like centralization and decentralization. You can centralize that gives you wonderful economies of scale, standardization, uh, operational excellence. The problem is the minute you centralize, you lose agility, you lose the ability to innovate, you lose the ab ability to be close to your to your market. So you can't focus exclusively on one. It will destroy the other. And the fact is you have to you have to swing between both. So it's like, am I going to I'm managing a team? I can either focus on the task or I can focus on building relationships between everyone. So we call this an either or continuum or mutually exclusive. Either we're gonna get the job done or we're gonna like each other, right? So this is how we, 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 we manage. We've created a problem, right? This is now a problem because it's mutually exclusive and so we, we tend to pick a spot. The reality is it's not a problem, it's a polarity. I want you to get the job done and I want you to have good relationships. I want both of them. I want task and I want relationship you got to move you have to change the way you think about the problem right so in other words i want the positive aspects if i only focus on task the positive aspects are i'll get the work done the team members will be proud everybody will be accountable the problem is there'll be a weak relationship amongst team members there'll be no team cohesion and members will fail to support each other if i only focus on relationship well, that's great. We all like each other. We'll sing Kumbaya around the fireside, uh, the, the fireside and the team will become more resilient and agile, but we'll miss deadlines. Uh, the team will lose motivation and there'll be no accountability. And by the way, I can apply this perfectly to the PIB going forward and all of us, what are we going to focus on? Tasks or relationships or both? So, so you know that a polarity is incorrectly diagnosed when this starts to happen. You will when you start to generate significant and unnecessary resistance to your solution, right? BEE. -E. There's huge resistance to this, right? It's because it was never a solution. And so now, the minute the solution, centralization is a solution, decentralization is a solution, the minute you generate resistance, you know that, it, that, that this is not a problem, this is a polarity. When you say, oh, it's okay, all we have to do is communicate more clearly. And when you do that and it creates even more resistance, then you know it's a polarity. You, it's a polarity when you're forced to pick a side, when power struggles start to happen, right? And the most powerful pole wins. And when the, whatever the winning solution becomes, later becomes the problem, right? Because BE was picked as a solution, now it's become the problem. And then this is, becomes the source of swing, the swinging pendulum in organizations and people become more and more frustrated because the problem never gets solved. So when you have a polarity and you recognize it, there's a number of things that you know. Both sides are right, and both sides need each other over time. So you need to centralize and decentralize. You need BEE, and you need to grow the economy. You need both, right? Power is not a zero-sum game. We've got, we can grow power. It's essential to empower both poles. Opposition to whatever you decide is actually a resource 
Um, because the other side's values and fears helps you to understand the polarity. It's one of the reasons why this process that we're using for PIB is so inclusive, because this, we need to listen to them. The smaller the opposition, the more you need to listen to those quiet voices. It's one of the reasons we want to hear everyone in these groups to pick up the polarity. And it is possible to manage a polarity well by getting a lot of the upside of both poles and minimizing the downside of each. So the cultural implication, folks, is that we need to suspend judgment, we need to tolerate ambiguity, and we need to figure out a way of getting the strength of both poles while minimizing the weaknesses of each. A good example in, in closing out is, you know, fixed mindset versus growth mindset. You know, the, the, there's a, we, we tend to categorize people who, um, you know, as being having a growth mindset or having a fixed mindset. We say, you know, people with, with a, a, a fixed a, a, a fixed mindset see problems. They say don't know. They focus on criticism. Uh, they say it's too hard. They focus on the difficulty and they get jealous. And then you scratch it out and you say, oh, people with a growth mindset are the opposite. That's actually not a very helpful way of thinking about this, actually, because we've actually what we've done here is we've created a problem. And what you've done is you've said you must either be fixed or you must be growth, right? Actually, if you go to Google, what Google has figured out, and this is a Google slide, by the way, and, and, and I've got a Microsoft slide that I'm going to show you next. What Google and Microsoft have figured out is people with a fixed mindset are really good at, at solving the problem with the current mission of the existing business. So where you've got good practice and best practice, a fixed mindset is very good. Flying an aeroplane. Good practice, best practice. I don't want to see people walking into a cockpit saying, hey, I'm going to throw away the flight plan. Let's just wing it today. I don't want to hear that. I don't want to watch, hear a guy go into a nuclear power station and go, you know, I'm not going to use a standard operating procedure. Let's, let's do some, use some novel practice, right? So there's a huge number of things in the payment industry, like in end-of-day settlement, for example. You need individual mastery. You need, it's a known and familiar situation, and you can solve the problem using past experience. So where... When you are in this model, you need people where you have a fixed mindset. It's actually what you need. It's the right thing. I, I want a pilot with a fixed mindset. I want an um, engineer. I want a, uh, you know, the guy running a nuclear, running Kuberg better have a fixed mindset. I don't want a guy with a growth mindset running businesses like that. You know, the person running my data center better have a fixed mindset. Then you get folks with a growth mindset. And growth mindsets have skills for new missions, the new digital business, right? They focus on teamwork, collaboration. They're very good at emergent practice and novel practice, high uncertainty. You've got to experiment. Situations requiring huge amounts of un uncertainty, massive risk-taking, massive creativity. Well, there's vast places in payments you don't want risk-taking, you don't want creativity, you don't want innovation, right? The, you, you don't want people fiddling around in a data center and blowing the thing up. So the answer is not either or. The answer is both. So what Microsoft did, this is a, a Microsoft slide. Microsoft re rewards people. And this is my, my final slide. Uh, Microsoft rewards people by saying, we actually need you to do both. We need you to be collaborative and we need you to be selfish. Right? How, how, because they've said, we want, we're going to reward both sides of this polarity. What does that mean? So the Microsoft incentive system works the way I've written it on the left-hand side. Firstly, one third of your bonus comes from what you deliver against your personal targets your key individual accomplishments that contributes to team, business, or customer results. So in other words, it's about you. The second two incentives are really interesting. The second one says, the second bonus comes by measuring to what extent did you contribute to the success of other people? To what extent did you, uh, did you help other people achieve their goals? One third of your bonus comes from that. And the last third of your bonus comes from to what extent did your results come from building on the work ideas or efforts of others? How did you work with other people to make yourself more successful? How did you take their ideas and their outputs? In other words, they've said, we're not going to focus on distribution. We're going to focus on production. We're going we're gonna to force you not to figure out that I win. If I get a bigger bonus, you get a smaller bonus. The question is, how do we grow the entire bonus pool so all of us get more, more money? Now, that's a brilliant way of, of managing a business, and it's why Microsoft today is worth $2 trillion. It's a $2 trillion company, and one of the things that really changed the company was this move by, by changing the way they reward people. And remember what I said to you, culture is about values, beliefs, behaviors, attitudes, uh, actions, results, 
rewards and penalties. And what Microsoft has done is Microsoft has said, if I change the reward system, I will automatically change the way people behave, the way people act, the results they achieve, and I'll change their behaviors and attitudes as we go forward. And I've just given you on the right hand side uh, so, so some of the things that they've done. So folks, just in closing out, we need to push for yes, both and thinking in the industry, not no, either, or. Right? We tend to think no, either, or, or yes, or no, but. That's how we tend to think. What we need to think is yes, both, and. I want both of these. I want, I want this and that. So we've got to change the way we think. We've got to push diversity of thought and actions. We've got to start saying, are there ways, other ways of solving problems that we haven't thought about in the past? And this means that we need to measure and reward collaboration. And we need, we need, we ourselves need to be seen to be engaging in it ourselves. I'll skip that. So in closing out, folks, just the key takeouts. We've got to move to critical thinking. It's about how we think rather than what we think. We've got to, we've got to face facts and, and accept that we are moving to a more mature ecosystem. And a more mature ecosystem fundamentally changes the way that we, we work with each other. We've got to accept that, that the entire industry has to go through a culture change because culture will eat strategy and the strategy is meaningless if the culture is wrong. You've seen it in, in, this, in the South African environment. We've had a strategy, right? We had RDP. I mean, RDP is a joke now given what's happened, but that was the strategy. Right. And the real problem was we didn't we didn't solve culture uh, going forward. We are every one of us has to be leaders of culture. Right. You're all president of South Africa, effectively. And you are all Gita for the next three years. You all have to think as if you are Gita. Right. You've got to think, well, what would Gita do? And that's what we all have to do. And that means that it's a it's a non zero sum game. We should be saying, how can I work on what you did so that I can do better? How can I help you to do better? How can we together grow the pool of, of revenue and, and grow the profit pools for all of us? To do that, we have to manage polarities. This is not a problem. If you treat this like a problem, this pro this situation will persist forever. It will never get resolved. And I'll be back in five years and the pendulum will just be swinging the other way. Finally, it does mean that we've got to all start changing the way we think. We've got to have both a growth and a fixed mindset, and it's not an either-or situation. Folks, thank you very much.